Well, they said it was hot <laughs> when we moved to Arizona. And somebody gave me a tip, and we've actually used this tip, and it works very well. Brennan, you may want to begin to apply this to your life. We turn on our oven at about 500 degrees in the morning, and we open it up, and we breathe in the air. And then we can go outside and work and do some things, and we run back inside when we're feeling too hot, and we just breathe in the oven air, and it feels like we're going out into air conditioning. I'm kidding. Please don't do that. We have been examining the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, and we firmly believe that Jesus can turn our lives upside down if we apply his word to our life. It's one thing to attend a worship service. It's a whole other thing to apply what you hear to your life. And we are firm believers that when we apply God's word to our lives, he will turn our lives upside down. Today, we are blessed to talk about food. <laughs> if you want your life turned upside down, just change the habit when it comes to eating food, right? Oh, it changes everything. Well, sort of. Uh, first, I want to talk about how America loves to eat. Everybody loves to eat. How many of you ate today? See? Everybody loves to eat. We have ice cream stores, coffee shops. We have fast food for tacos, for chicken, for beef, for burgers, for pasta, for sandwiches. By a show of hands, how many of you enjoy eating French fries? Raise your hand. A okay, little stat, a little interesting fact. The average American eats 29 pounds of French fries every year. A lot of French fries. How many enjoy eating pizza? All right. The average American eats 23 pounds of pizza every year. How many of you enjoy drinking soda? Raise your hand. You might not enjoy it, but you do it. The average American drinks 53 gallons of soda every year. Now, the final one for Arizona, this works well. Raise your hand if you enjoy eating ice cream. Okay, the average American eats 24 pounds of ice cream every year. And it is estimated that by the time the average American turns 80 years old, they will have eaten nearly 68 tons of food. <laughs> That's a lot of food. Imagine that line of vehicles, garbage trucks, whatever it would be with 68 tons of food. That's what the average American eats and consumes in their life. Those stats, I don't know about you, those stats kind of make me feel like going on a diet. Those stats kind of make me go, okay, lay off the cheeseburgers for a little bit. One thing is clear, though, we love to eat. In fact, we have to eat. The reality is, if we do not eat, we die, right? We need to eat. We need to consume food. How long could a person live without food? Jesus went without eating for 40 days and 40 nights in the desert. Mahatma Gandhi went without eating anything for 26 days. And prisoners on hunger strikes usually reach about 60 days before their organs start shutting down. We don't like to go without eating food. Raise your hand if you enjoy it when you're on a diet. We don't like going without food. That's why diets fail. We want to raid the refrigerator at 10 o'clock at night. We want to finish off that pan of brownies. Uh, we want to eat that bag of Doritos that's sitting on the counter or the leftover birthday cake. We want to finish that off. We enjoy eating food. I have a particular time of day every day that I I need to eat by. At 7.45 in the morning, I need to have eaten breakfast. If not, I get hangry. Do you know what hangry is? Right, hangry is a combination between hungry and angry. I get irritable. I get frustrated. If I don't eat lunch by 11.45, 12 o'clock, I start getting a little bit hangry. If I'm in the middle of the meeting, I want to say, hey, shut up, it's time to eat. Right, I'm ready to go eat. Uh, uh, same thing around dinner. Well, today, if you've not guessed, we're talking about food, sort of. We're actually talking about the topic of fasting. 
You can follow along on page 964 in the Bible underneath the seat in front of you. If you don't have a Bible, I want to encourage you to take that Bible home. We really believe that God's Word will change our lives, turn our lives upside down if we apply His Word to our lives. Uh, Let's read together on page 964, Matthew chapter 6, verse 16 through 18. Jesus, as He was speaking, addressed this very topic of fasting. Jesus said, and when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites. That would be hangry. For they disfigure their faces, again hangry, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret." And your father who sees in secret will reward you. Now, I know it's not a favorite topic that we like to talk about, especially for Baptists. Baptists don't like to talk about fasting that much. We do enjoy eating. We enjoy eating food. And I think as human beings, most of us enjoy food. However, fasting is a spiritual discipline that's often talked about and encouraged in scripture so first let's make sure that we all understand exactly what fasting is fasting is depriving myself of food or drink Uh, that doesn't sound very appealing We don't like the sound of that. Depriving ourselves of food and drink actually go against the physical needs of our body. It it scrapes us wrong. Our body says, you have to eat the Doritos. You have to eat the pan of brownies. You have to eat the pizza that's in the fridge or you will die. That, that's what our bodies say to us. That's what they say when we're on a, on a diet. It's what they say to us when we're fasting. I need this food. I'm craving it. I'm hungry. I must have it. Intentionally going without food or drink is hard. Now, I want to acknowledge as we begin to talk about fasting, there are some people who are physically unable to fast. They cannot fast because of medical reasons or physical reasons, and and they're unable to abstain from food or unable to abstain from drink. Uh, So those individuals may fast from technology. They may fast from entertainment. They may fast from social media, from their phones. But I do want to be clear that fasting is not a biblical fast. I'm not encouraging you, if you are unable to fast, to fast biblically. Uh, But a biblical fast is abstaining from food or drink. Now, if you want to experience fasting and you're not able to, certainly you can fast from social media. You can fast from uh, people you don't like. You can fast from, uh, you know, you can fast from other things. But a biblical fast, right, is abstaining from food or drink. Jesus didn't fast from social media, right? Jesus was fasting from food or drink. Now, some people may fast by skipping a meal. Some people may fast for 24 hours. Some people may fast for three days or 30 days. I knew a pastor uh, one time leading his church in revival and the 40 days leading up to uh, the revival, he fasted the entire time. Uh, Biblical fasting does not necessarily have a set length of time, but in every case, Fasting is abstaining from food or drink for a given length of time. So now that we have established what fasting is, right, we've established that, we have to ask the question, why on earth would a follower of Jesus fast? Why on earth would a follower of Jesus choose, knowingly choose to say, I'm not going to eat or drink and cause myself to suffer? Think about it. A follower of Jesus is one who has accepted Christ as his Savior and Lord. He has been saved. He is born again. He has been changed on the inside. He has the Holy Spirit living in him. He has the guarantee of heaven and all eternity living in heaven with God. He has God's presence in his life. Why on earth would a follower of Jesus make it difficult for himself to follow Jesus. Why fast? Well, because fasting renews dependency. Fasting renews dependency. 
At the beginning of his public ministry on the earth, Jesus had gone out into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights to pray and fast. He had no food for 40 days, no drink for 40 days. And during that season of fasting, I can guarantee you, though scripture doesn't tell us that, his body was weakened. His body was dehydrated. His body was literally wasting away. He had grown weak. He had grown hungry. And wouldn't you know it, during that feeble state, the devil showed up and tried to tempt him and tried to get him to break his fast so that he would get the glory and not God. He dared Jesus to turn the rocks and stones in the wilderness into food. You can see that on page 961 in Matthew chapter 4, beginning at verse 3. During that time, which is the fast, the devil came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, No. The scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus teaches us today that food and drink are not the only things that we need to live. See, you need more than food and drink and shelter. There's one other thing, and oxygen, there's one other thing that you need to live by. When we fast, it takes us to a different place. It makes us uncomfortable it challenges us and it reconnects me in my relationship with God in a way that obedience and scripture reading and prayer simply does not do by itself. Fasting is a demonstration of faith. Fasting is me actually believing that I cannot live without the word of God in my life. It's depriving myself of food and drink and focusing in, zeroing in on the one who my life is truly dependent upon. It's a step of faith. Now, let's look back at that passage of scripture in verse 16 of chapter 6. Jesus said, and when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites. For they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. This is really funny. I, I can't imagine as those hypocrites were standing around Jesus who were in the middle of their fast what their faces looked like. Jesus said that they made their faces look gloomy. My daughter Jessie does a very good job of making her face look gloomy. Anytime she wants something, we say no, she immediately does this. <laughs> now, I imagine that when these hypocrites caused their faces to look gloomy, they felt like they had to take it to the next level, and the next level was they disfigured their faces. Right? I mean, so they're making, they're going without their, their food and they're literally starving themselves. They're fasting. They're not eating food. And to make sure that everybody knew they were uncomfortable, whenever that big loaf of bread would pass on by, they'd disfigure their face. And look that, with that look of disdain because they're holier than thou, right? I, it's really funny that Jesus, he acknowledged this. He said they were using their faces to draw attention to themselves about their holiness, about how holy they were. And they, it was almost that when I see it, I, I read it, I think about Dana Carvey from Saturday Night Live, the church lady, right? It's that, you know, well, isn't that special, you know? They're literally disfiguring their faces, making themselves look gloomy. Why? Because they want the attention of the world fixed on them. We talked about this a few weeks ago when we addressed the public life of a follower of Jesus and, and what that ought to look like. Boy, these people, these hypocrites, wanted everyone to know what they were doing. And the reality is... Because they had such an attitude of wanting everyone to know that they disfigured their faces and they made themselves look gloomy, it was for nothing. 
It was for nothing. You know, if I'm going to skip a meal, I'm going to skip a meal for something. I, I want to be rewarded for skipping that meal. And being rewarded for skipping that meal is not trying to draw attention to it. It's actually deflecting it and turning attention away from it. I want God to see. I want God to know that I am fasting. For them, it was a big waste of time. They were not reconnecting with God. They were not seeking his presence or guidance. They were only starving for the attention of other people. Literally. They were starving for the attention of others. When we fast, we would do well to remember that fasting should be partnered with Scripture reading and prayer. Scripture reading, worship, and prayer. Otherwise, you're only starving yourself. That's all you're doing. If you are not seeking God while you are fasting, you are only starving yourself. Fasting proves and demonstrates that I truly believe that we do not live merely by food. That I do not live merely by drink or merely by water. When I fast, I demonstrate and I prove I am placing my faith in God's hands. And I am saying, God, I need you more than I need air. I need you more than I need food. I need you more than I need water. God, I am dependent upon you because man cannot live by bread alone. And if I'm truly, truly convinced that I need God's word just as much as I need food and drink, then I will be reading God's word, searching God's word, studying God's word, meditating on God's word, and memorizing God's word as I fast. During your regular meal time, here's a practical thing that you could do if you, if you want to begin to implement a fast. Sit down with your Bible and open up your regular uh, worship music that you listen to. Sit down with your Bible, sit down with a pen, begin to listen to worship music, and in fact, replace that time that you would normally eat uh, your meal, replace that time. Instead of having a meal spread out in front of you, let the, have, have the Word of God spread out in front of you. Feast on this. Jeremiah talked about God's word and he said, your words are like honey. Your words are sweet. Your words challenge me. Your words sharpen me. Your words change me. They're like a burning fire. It's like a, it's like a hammer. It changes me. So when you fast, sit down with a copy of God's word that you can read and that you can understand and feast, literally feast on the word of God. Reflect on it. You don't want to just starve yourself. You want to practice your faith. Now, in this passage of Scripture, Jesus was taught that we did not have to let other people know. In fact, he warned against it. But I want you to know something, that if my heart is pure, others can know when I'm fasting. If my heart is pure, other people can know that I'm fasting. Uh, here goes Pastor Joe now teaching something that Jesus didn't teach, right? He did it a few weeks ago. He's doing it again tonight. Jesus said, don't tell others. And the pastor is saying that we should tell others or that we can tell others. Now, let me explain why I think that. As the first church began to grow and they began to reach people and they began to see people giving their lives to Jesus, the first church was growing. It was multiplying 3,000 to 5,000 to 10,000 to 15,000 to 20,000. As that early church was growing in the book of Acts, a group of men, godly men, gathered together to focus on what God wanted for them to do next. They gathered together... And in Acts 13, 2, it tells us exactly what they did when they gathered together. One day, as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Dedicate Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I have called them. When these men in Acts fasted, they joined together in fasting and in prayer to seek out what God would have for them next. Then, through that group fasting, 
They received a special message from the Holy Spirit telling them to set aside Paul and Barnabas. And now we know what happened when Paul and Barnabas were set aside. Well, we have the rest of the New Testament that was written. We have the gospel going out around the world, literally around the world in their, their, their hemisphere. Why? Because this group of men talked about fasting together and they worshiped together and they said, God, what do you want us to do together? So let me ask you this. What would your life group look like if you regularly fasted and prayed for individuals who are walking through a difficult time in their marriage? Or maybe they were walking through a difficult season of health or maybe they experienced the death of a loved one or, or a financial problem. What if within your life group, you intentionally began to choose to fast and pray together for one another? As we talked about summer life, I want to make a big plug for that. If you're not involved yet with a, a life group, summer life is a great way to test the waters to see if a life group is for you, where you get to go and have questions answered and talk and sit around a group. Now, it is a little bit different than our home groups, our life groups. It is a little bit different, but it's a great place to begin to connect with other followers of Jesus. So if you feel like you're out on your own sometime, register, stop by the booth tonight, check out Summer Life and sign up for that. Now, other people can know if you are fasting, if your heart and your motives are pure. In fact, when a group of people are fasting and praying together for a specific purpose, life change will occur. The Apostle Paul even encourages a husband and wife to fast together in 1 Corinthians 7, 5. Now, it is a bit of an unusual selection of a passage of Scripture that I'm about to read to you. But I want to use this to demonstrate to you that Paul actually talked about husbands, husbands, oh, I don't know where that came from, husband, where husbands and wives could fast and pray together. Paul was speaking about sexual activity in the marriage between a husband and a wife, and this is what he said. 1 Corinthians 7, 5, he said, do not deprive each other of sexual relations unless you both agree to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time so you can give yourselves more completely to fasting and prayer. Afterward, you should come together again so that Satan won't be able to tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I read that this week and I said, honey, I found my new memory verse. All the men in here just highlighted that verse, right? <laughs> Husbands and wives, what if you began fasting together for your children's future? What if you began on a regular basis to fast and pray over your children's education? Or you fasted and prayed for your child's teacher? Or you fasted and prayed when your child was getting bullied? Or you fasted and prayed that your children would uh, grow into godly men and women and they would find a godly spouse to live the rest of their lives with and that they would make an incredible impact on this world. What if you fasted and prayed for your children once a month or once a week? What if you fasted and prayed for your own marital relationship to improve instead of the constant back and forth what if you dedicated a day of the week to set aside in your marriage to fast and pray and seek out God? See, we can fast if our walk with God is not where we, we think it ought to be. We think fasting is just for those people who have that close relationship with God. In fact, if you are in a spiritual rut, if you are in a spiritual dry spell, if your relationship with God is not where you would like it to be, then I would encourage you to set aside a day and fast and pray. We can fast if we're troubled in our finances and say, God, I'm overwhelmed with debt. I need you. And we can fast. We can fast about if we're unclear about a direction to go. If we don't know what our next step ought to be in life, we can fast and pray. We can fast for a friend to experience a life-changing relationship with Jesus. We can fast and pray that our character would begin to reflect more of the character of God in our lives. Now take a look in that last fill in the blank in your sermon notes. Can you agree with me in your spirit and agree to fast before my next big step? 
Can you agree to do that? Don't you think it ought to be the right thing? And maybe you've tried many other ways for your relationship with your spouse or relationship with your children or your relationship with your coworkers. Maybe you've, maybe you've tried many ways in searching out the scripture, but have you gone the extra mile in a fast and asked God while you fasted and while you prayed for him to work and to move. Now, I'm not going to pretend to know and understand every situation that you've been in, but before you make your next big decision, fast. Before you make that next big purchase, fast. Fast and pray. Invite your closest friends to join you in a fast. Say, hey, this is a struggle that I'm experiencing right now in life, and every Thursday for the next two months, I'm going to be fasting. Would you join me in this fast? I earnestly need to hear from God about what I need to do next. I believe as followers of Jesus, if we begin to implement a fast into our lives, it literally will turn our lives upside down. It will turn our prayer life upside down. It will turn our grace life upside down. It will, it, will, it will turn everything about the way that we love other people upside down because as we fast, as we experience God's presence, as he changes our character, as he guides us, as he leads us, he will lead us to love others with this life-changing love, the powerful presence of God in our lives. I want my life to be turned upside down. I want to begin applying and implementing a regular fast, and I want to encourage you and your spouse or your children or your life group or your closest friends to fast together over agreed upon needs and seek out what it is that God has for your next. Let's pray together. Father, we want to say when it comes to the fast, probably most of us don't practice it as often as we should. And most of us don't practice it as often as we need to. So Lord, we ask tonight as we hear from you and hear your word, that you would help us to have that desire to walk in obedience and apply your word to our lives. Help us to renew our dependency upon you, to lean into you, and to grow in our relationship with you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.